Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to George Talks after our slightly longer than planned summer break. Um, we have three excellent uh, talks lined up for you uh, between now and Christmas. Uh, in December, we'll, we will have Paul Anderson talking about Orwell in Tribune, um, including all the As I Please. Uh, in November, we, we have Carol B. Dispat revisiting uh, Burmese days. And tonight, I'm delighted to say we've, we've got uh, Andy Durgan, who has published the most authoritative book at the moment in Spanish, but between us, we hope he'll soon be able to publish it in English. Um, a, a, an authoritative study of all the international volunteers to, to the PUM. Andy has lived and worked uh, in university in, in Barcelona right. for many so years. And uh, I'm looking forward, as I'm sure you all are, to hearing him. So over to you, Andy. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Quinton, and thank you very much to the Orwell's, George Orwell's site for inviting me to speak uh, about uh, my new book uh, on the volunteers of foreign volunteers of the Pooh. The international brigades uh, are well, uh, is a subject which has been thoroughly studied in Civil War history. Um, the main body of international volunteers, 32,000 foreign uh, combatants. Um, what is far less known, really hasn't been studied at all, are the hundreds of uh, other volunteers who fought with the workers' militias and didn't at least initially form part of the brigades. Um, so the aim of my talk is to introduce my book, talk about certain elements of it. The book covers the story of the 500 or so um, volunteers who fought with the PUM. Um, and it also deals with their lives prior to going to Spain, um, their experiences at the front and in the rear guard, uh, often as victims of repression. It deals with their lives after the Civil War, during the Second World War. Some of them, many of them, ended up in concentration camps, others fought the resistance or with the, the Allied armies, and also the post-world, uh, post-war period as well, where I have information on them. Um, the book is also contextualized by sections, uh, quite a considerable amount of information about the PUM itself, about its military policy, about its militias, most of which has not appeared in any other publication. It also talks about the position of the party in relation to women in the revolution and the campaign of slander and repression the party would be subject to um, after um, um, 2000, uh, sorry, 1937. Um, so uh, it contains also um, little known bi biographical detail about many of the prominent volunteers, including some mentioned in homage to Catalonia, such as George Cobb, and curious episodes about uh, some of these people, for example, Bob Edwards, the commander of the British contingent, who later would be accused of having been a KGB spy when he was a Labour MP. I cover these as episodes as well, as well as talking right at the end of the book in the epilogue about um, George Orwell and the Cold War. Uh, the sources I used were very varied. There's no archive of these um, volunteers, and it's a question of looking for them, information about, for, about them from different uh, archives. Um, in particular, the Soviet archives, the archives of the International Brigades, there's a lot of information about the Poon volunteers as well, including quite a lot of details about their persecution and about the accusations against them. Uh, I used also the archives of the, in, Span in Spain, Salamanca, the military archives in Avila, the archives of the Catalan government, plus a whole series of uh, uh, newspapers where you can find different uh, information. The first thing to mention, of course, is homage to Catalonia. I'm not going to talk about homage to Catalonia. I assume a great length, at least. 
I assume most of you, if not all of you have read it, uh, you probably realize that Homage to Catalonia is the most, probably the most read book uh, on the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and this uh, is not surprising. I mean, it's a tremendous uh, text and account of Orwell's experience. However, I need to contextualize it a bit because of course, Homage to Catalonia is not a history of the whole war. That wasn't George Orwell's intention. It's neither is it even a history of the poon at the front. And it is strengths of it, of course, is that it shows Orwell's political development and his specific experiences. Um, but uh, they are his specific experiences. Uh, it also is a book, as you may well know, that's provoked a, a lot of hostility amongst, I would say, the majority of experts on the Spanish Civil War. It's not a popular book. Uh, it's met with a lot of criticism because uh, Orwell is accused of not having understood the Spanish Civil War. The hostility is such that, um, for example, Herbert Matthews, very well-known American journalist who was in the Spain during the Civil War, would say in 1971 that Orwell's book had done more to blacken the loyalist cause than any work written by the enemies of the Second Republic. I think that's a good uh, resume of how it's uh, received in some um, some quarters. Now, uh, many of these uh, many of these volunteers had been refugees. Many of them had been uh, refugees in, in Spain before the war began, particularly from anti-fascist, some sorry, from fascist countries. They were anti-fascist refugees. Uh, mainly Germans and Italians. These are the two largest groups inside the uh, Boom volunteers. Uh, their background was often similar to those of the International Brigades. Most of them were workers. Uh, many of them had a long experience in the workers' movement, the anti fascist movement in their own countries. The difference, of course, was that these volunteers thought they were for fighting for the revolution, not just for the defense of uh, liberal democracy. And of course, the other the tragic difference was the slander they would be subject to uh, uh, in the context of the intervention of Stalin, Stalinism in the Spanish War. As I said before, I, I think there were about, I calculate there were about 500 of these um, volunteers. I've managed to identify 367 of those from 28 different nationalities. One of the um, interesting one of the many interesting things about them was the number of Jewish um, volunteers, particularly amongst the Germans. There's a large Jewish contingent amongst the Germans, not to be, so obviously this is not surprising given uh, the position of Jewish militants and Jewish people as victims of fascism. Many of them were veterans of the revolutionary movements of the 1920s, and there were a whole uh, considerable number of founder members of the German and Italian communist parties who'd since broken with the party. Politically, they were uh, often uh, dissident communists and belonged to various different communist groups. The PUM itself uh, considered itself a communist party, but of course was highly critical and broken with uh, Stalinism. Some were Trotskyists. This is worth mentioning because very often um, the PUM is uh, described as Trotskyist. It wasn't a Trotskyist organization, the Trotskyists were part of the volunteers, foreign volunteers, and there were Trotskyists inside the PUM, but it wasn't as such a Trotskyist party. Others were members of other uh, oppositional currents inside international communism. More important were the members of various left socialist parties who had broken with the main socialist and labor parties during the 30s in the context of economic crisis and the rise of fascism. One of those, of course, being the in independent labor party, of course, with whom Orwell would uh, fight. Um, there were two main uh, international units, uh, the one being the one you can see some uh, members of it on the screen, uh, the international column uh, or the international Lenin column. Uh, this was made up of mainly French and Italian revolutionaries, was organized in August 1936 and eventually uh, numbered some 200 uh, volunteers uh, and existed until the end of 36. It was then replaced mostly by and most of the volunteers of the international uh, column would move into the new shock battalion, which I'll be talking a bit about in a minute, uh, which was then dominated very much by the by the Germans. Uh, and the shock battalion would play an important role in the fighting around Weska. Others 
uh, when the international column was uh, dissolved, some national groups had their own units, were small Italian and French units. And in January 1937, uh, as some of you will know, the first volunteers of the ILP uh, arrived, 25 uh, ILP volunteers arrived. Um, in all the 39 volunteers passed through the, uh, the IIP contingent, um, including, of course, all itself. 30 of these were British citizens. This picture here is of some of them, or it's not in, maybe all took the picture. I, I don't know who took the picture, but he's not in this picture. Um, this is probably before he joined the IIP group uh, in the Sierra of Arcu Pieri. Um, well, you can see, and I will mention two people you can see in the picture. There's a sort of, you can see a slightly inky cross by the young man who's crouching down. That is Bob Smiley, of course, who will be a victim of a very suspicious death later in 1937. And to his left, standing with the hat and glasses, is Louis Levin, American, who is the American doctor, which is meant, who's mentioned, of course, in Homeless Catalonia. Um, now, Homish Catalonia gives him, but we know from Homish Catalonia that the British contingent uh, took really was not involved in any major action. And uh, the image that, of course, all gives us is one of very badly equipped militia and um, a very passive front. This is not strictly true. Um, I go to some length in the book to show this was not the case. So while the front they were on was certainly a lot quieter and less important militarily than the Madrid front or even the Northern fronts, uh, it wasn't as quiet as Orwell makes out. One of the reasons um, Orwell gets such a negative uh, image of the militia is because he was sent to the front with a new column, which the Poon um, organized in December, 1936. It was the last column of volunteers they organized because by then uh, the militias were filling up with recruits because of militarization and the transformation of militias into the popular army. This column, the um, Juventud Comunista Iberica column, was made up of very young volunteers. Uh, the original intention was to have get 2,500 new volunteers. They got about 800. Um, and really, was the were the younger uh, members of the Poom youth or around the Poom who hadn't joined in, in July, August, and probably the least prepared to fight. They were sent to the Sierra Alcubierre, which Orwell, of course, describes, which was by far, was by far the quietest part of the Huesca Front, and, of course, put a long way from the enemy lines. This um, was discussed at Orwell, of course, and, of course, gives this image of... Uh, really nothing much happening. What all was unaware of uh, was in fact that in front of him where the fascist uh, position was, a position which was known as uh, impossible because it was considered impossible to take, there were trenches actually with the militias of the Catalan Communist Party, the PSUC, very close indeed to the enemy. The reason why the Puma had been put so far back in these hills was partly to do with they were not being trusted, partly due to their very new, very raw and badly equipped troops, but they were a small uh, part of the uh, Poom's militia. The vast majority of the Poom militia were sent to Grand Wesco, where in fact the ILP group would be sent at the end of February 37. And this is where the fighting took place uh, um, and some pretty bitter and, and uh, tough fighting happened here. Um, on this map, this is a fascist map, um, and there's a number of things that can be pointed out about this. But first of all, just a few comments about the Poon militia. The Poon militia, what became known as the Lenin division, had around 6,000 um, fighters in it. Uh, it was badly armed, this is true, not as bad as Orwell makes out. For example, the whole division only had 25 machine guns, which uh, in terms of trench warfare, of course, made it extremely difficult for them to have more than a defensive uh, position. They only had two batteries of uh, artillery. Uh, and, but it's worth pointing out that the other uh, militias around and the area were similarly equipped. It wasn't just the Poon that badly, well, they probably the worst equipped, but the others were that well equipped. The Communist Division, which was slightly bigger, had only 45 machine guns. The Duruti uh, Division, famous Duruti Division, which is around Zaragoza, had 116 machine guns. So the boom was the worst uh, arm, but it wasn't 
the others weren't that well armed. The other thing to mention is the famous um, 1898 Mauser, which all were had, which he complained about this terrible old rifle. In fact, the, the 1898 Mauser was a standard issue of the Spanish army at the time. Uh, and the enemy would have had this the same rifle, in fact, at, for, at least at first, until they got better German and Italian arms. The other point to mention is the question of discipline uh, and, um, and, uh, and the question of a centralized army. There are, uh, it's quite common in history of the Spanish war to present the Pumas being opposed to a centralized army, uh, generally undisciplined. This wasn't the case. They were uh, out of the militia units on the Wesker Front considered the most disciplined. They were regularly praised by the regular army officers who uh, were um, commanding the, the front in that um, period when it was integrated with the popular army. Their trenches were uh, extremely well built. These weren't the one that all were in, but certainly the ones uh, in front of Wesker. Uh, and the Pum itself defended from very early on the idea of a centralized army. It wanted an army like the Red Army. The, uh, in the Russian Revolution, in the Russian Civil War, this was its model. Uh, but of course, for the Pum politically, uh, it wanted an army which was connected to the revolution, not the defense of uh, bourgeois democracy. Uh, in terms of the, what happens around the front, obviously I can't do this in great detail, but just a couple of things to be mentioned. You can see here two villages, Kisena and Tiers. Um, those of you who've been on trips to the uh, on the oral trips to uh, Wesker may have been in this area. This was a scene of very heavy fighting in uh, September 1936, when 650 Boom militia, 150 whom were foreigners, um, were positioned between these two villages between fascist forces who were also behind on the ridge behind. Uh, this eventually, they eventually expelled them from the ridge behind and established their positions there to the east of Wesker. You can also see, um, well, you may be, I hope you can see, what it says in the middle of the map, position number two. This is the, was known as the Loma of the Manicomio, the Loma of the uh, Lunatic Asylum, to translate it directly, which was assaulted in March 1937 by the Shock Battalion. Orwell mentions this, um, but unfortunately has, has the, uh, the had the impression that it led to, it was just a, nothing happened much at all, that way we were beaten back, but that is not true. It was a very bloody, attack and they actually managed to take the ridge for six hours. And most importantly, uh, on this map, the fascist military of Marta X, you can see the X with two. This is uh, just the north of that X, position number one, this is the major defensive position, the blue dots of the fascist trenches. During the offences of June 1937, the most important offensive attempt, attempt to take Wesker, the Poon troops, uh, took this uh, position. They were the only people to take any, the only fighters to take any position during this offensive and uh, lost hundreds of their men in the process. Uh, in fact, that Orwell does mention this, but what's significant about this, apart from the fact it showed the uh, Pum militia are just as courageous as all the other troops around them, or if not more so, but it took place on the 16th of June, the very day which uh, the Pum was repressed in the rear guard. It's being, its members were being arrested in the rear guard, being accused of fascist while hundreds of its militia were dying uh, on, at the gates of Wesker. Now, the contribution of the foreigners to the Pum militia was in two areas in particular, one as officers and uh, political commissars and also in the medical service. So I've managed to identify 25 different foreign officers and 11 different political commissars of the militia who were uh, in in the uh, who were foreign. I mean, I've got I've got a few pictures here. I hope you can see them okay. Um, on the on the left, looking at your screen on the left, you can see Mika and Hippolito Echeverri, who were two Argentinian revolutionaries who were in Madrid at the beginning of the war. And Hippolito was the commander of the first um, Poon column that left Madrid. He was he was killed on the Guadalajara front in August. Uh, 1937, and Mika uh, would eventually become the commander of one of the Poom's two small companies of militiamen in, around Madrid during the siege of Madrid. She was the only woman uh, officer who uh, was a combatant uh, and uh, uh, is quite exceptional for that. Uh, she's written, uh, she has a, wrote her 
uh, by her memoirs of the war, which are extremely interesting. I have a chapter on her experience in the war and also reflecting upon her role as a woman in this extremely male world. Another person we can see uh, in, this, in this slide is Enrico Russo, founder member of the Italian Communist Party, a leading member of the workers' movement in Naples, who was a dissident who supported the um, uh, Amadeo Bordiga, who was a left leader, a left leader of the Italian Communist Party. He was the commander of the international column. Uh, we can also see Walter Schwartz as another example of the type of uh, volunteer. Walter Schwartz was a Jewish tailor, German Jewish tailor, who from Berlin, who was forced to leave Germany in 1932 after he was involved in an alteration uh, with a clash with the police. He was a member of a distant opposition communist party, uh, which had been formed in 1928. Schwartz would be the secretary of the Poon uh, branch in the Gracia district of uh, Barcelona. He was later the uh, liaison between the German, the, the very large German contingent and the rest of the Poon. He would be a political commissar of the shock battalion was arrested like so many others would be in, in his case in the August of 1937 and he would eventually escape at the last minute January 1939 from prison in Barcelona at the time the fascists were entering the city. Also here I put a picture of Benjamin Lewinsky as most many of you would have heard of of course because all talks about him in the in homage to Catalonia. Just briefly to say about Lewinsky and um, or would identify as being 24 years old, it's really 20 years old. The reason he became an officer was because George Cobb, who I'll be talking about a bit later, a bit later um, had, had named him a commander of a company of uh, volunteers, which included uh, the British contingent eventually, because he spoke five languages. And that was quite useful. Lewinsky would later go on to be uh, fight in the Second World War uh, and um, was quite a hero in that context as well. But finally, and most importantly, uh, on the right of the screen, you can see Hans Reiter. Hans Reiter is undoubtedly the most important of the officers, foreign officers of whom he commanded the shock battalion. Reiter, unlike the others, and like most of the other foreign volunteers or officers, was not uh, particularly left wing, uh, in fact, not left wing at all. He was a full member of the Foreign Legion. He comes from it came from a military family. Uh, but his family were anti-Nazis. His father was murdered by the Nazis. And he, uh, after being in the Foreign Legion, uh, came to Spain just before the war and would join, the, eventually join the Poon militia and lead the shock battalion. But when uh, he was um, considered uh, to be an outstanding officer, he actually led them into battle and so on and so forth, got wounded three times, later on commanded a uh, mixed, but a rather mixed, a mixed battalion of the popular army, and most uh, significantly would uh, eventually end up in the Free French Forces, which uh, landed with the Allied forces in 1944. In France, uh, the French, the Le Kirk column, were the, uh, the head of the Allied forces when they entered Paris in August 1944, and at the head of the French column was the famous Ninth Company of the Spanish uh, political exiles, in, which included writer, not no one actually connected the two people because he was known as Juanito, but in fact it was writer, and not only was writer in this uh, uh, column of French troops that entered into Paris, but was actually in command of the half track, which uh, was the first armored vehicle of the French column to arrive at the Place de la Ville on the 24th of August 1944. Now, the other contribution was medical services. There were 18, at least 18 nurses and doctors who were foreign. Most of them were women. Um, now there weren't a great number of women foreign militia uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the militia uh, amongst the foreign volunteers. However, there were some very significant uh, individuals. Um, what I can't really go into detail this, we could talk about a discussion if you wish, but some. Um, of course, the image of the woman militia is one of the most striking images of the of the um, Spanish Revolution, um, and of course, was a really represented a rupture, a break with the past and and with the near future as well. The role of women really a, a dramatic change. The presence of women in the front as fighters was very brief. 
because with the militarization of the militias, women were withdrawn from the front line and all the different forces, including the uh, supported this move, uh, despite the fact that in Madrid, Mika Echeverri continued to be an officer, but um, formally at least they supported this and women were relegated to uh, what were considered to be feminine roles, which uh, included medical service, but also, of course, as, in fact, all kinds of cooking and cleaning and so on and so forth. However, this shouldn't talk, take away from the change in the relative sense, which happens in the opening up of all sorts of different possibilities for women in the Spanish Revolution. The ending of the revolution, the crushing of the revolution, of course, would also mean the ending of this particularly um, dramatic role for women. Here I've got um, pictures of a number of them. Uh, Angela Wasserman uh, was an uh, Austrian who in initially was with the communist uh, medical service. She was expelled, accused of being a Trotskyist, although I don't think she actually was, but who knows why she was expelled. Obviously, she was distant of some sort. Eva Laufer, another German. Eva Laufer is actually mentioned in, uh, by Orwell. Or Orwell doesn't know it's her. He describes her during the May as a subscription of a, woman, a German militia woman. It's actually her. Uh, and um, Olga Price, who was Polish, they were all medical students and all uh, served as um, nurses. Now, the most, the most interesting figure here is um, Margaret Zimbal, who would be a martyr for the Poom uh, in a, a militia. She was a very young, German exile who'd left her family because her father was a Nazi in 1933 and after spending time in Madrid where she made lived by singing on the street with her boyfriend uh, joined the Poo militia uh, boy, her boyfriend her partner was killed at, at a side in Mallorca in August 1936 Zimbal then ended up on the uh, on the Wesca front the picture in the middle of the militia on the three militia uh, fighters on the top of the ruins of the castle of um, Monte Aragon, which is just in front of our uh, Wesker, which was taken by the Poon troops at the end of August 1936. That is, um, is her in the middle. This is not many people actually know. It's a very famous Civil War picture taken by Augusti um, Centellas. Um, and Zimbal died at 20 years old during the offense of October uh, against, um, against Wesker and became, like I said, a martyr for the spoon. Use. Now, of course, one of the major questions about the war from the point of view of the boom, of course, is that they would become um, victims of persecution and were made illegal in, well, effectively made illegal in June 16th to June 1937, accused of being um, an, a, a fascist or being aligned with the fascist and with the enemy. Um, this the repression of the boom has to be sent, seen in a, in a context, both the attempt by the Popular Front government to finish with the revolution, which had started in July 36, but also in the case of the boom, it also is in terms of the context of the rise of Stalinism. It can't be separated from what was happening uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, where uh, this this period of 37 to 38, according to Soviet sources, over 600,000 people, nearly 700,000 people were executed for political reasons. You know, the com transformation, complete uh, finish of a process of transformation of the Soviet Union to a, a police state and a dictator and a, and a very a vicious dictatorship. Of course, this contrasts dramatically with a the role of the international brigades who were eventually organized by the communists and were extremely courageous, etc. The contradiction, of course, has led to all sorts of different interpretations of what exactly was happening. But for the boom, this is very clear. This was this um, um, campaign against them, where they were accused of being spies, began to intensify, particularly after May the 37, when there was uh, fighting in the streets between those who defended the revolution and those who defended the Republican government, uh, the so-called May Days, and the sort of propaganda that was coming out against the Poom uh, was, you can see an image here, of you know, the Poom is a, a, with, a, with a swastika and so on and so forth. But after May 37, in fact, in communist propaganda, the Poom was actually accused of being a fascist organization, not just infiltrated by fascists, actually being a fascist organization. Now for the volunteers, foreign volunteers, this was particularly difficult 
situation because being the majority, majority of them are from authoritarian governments, uh, Italians and French, um, Germans in particular, and were singled out uh, because in the minds of the Stalinist, the Stalinist persecutors, uh, by being German in it itself was some sort of uh, su uh, sus very suspicious and they were accused uh, systematically of being uh, agents of the Gestapo. Now, some of the volunteers, when the Pum uh, division was dissolved, uh, after the June of the offensive, which I mentioned before, after which, hundred, which hundreds of their members have been killed. Um, when they were dissolved, some managed to leave the country, especially those that came from uh, democratic countries or being one of them, because he describes how he uh, fled from Barcelona. Others uh, remained in the army. The, the repression of the Pumas, I'm going to explain, was hard, but wasn't um, coherent for a number of reasons, I would explain. Uh, so. Some of these volunteers just integrated into the popular army or into the international brigade. Some of them were officers. There was not necessarily a problem with this uh, with these people, but others were, were subject to repression uh, in a quite fairly arbitrary manner. Now I, I've come got details of 104 foreigners who either fought or collaborated with the film who were arrested, and no doubt would be more, and they were subject to uh, the the attentions of the um, special State Information Department, which is an anti uh, counter uh, espionage unit set up at this time by the Spanish government, which was staffed mainly by foreign communists, many of whom were members of the NKVD, the Soviet secret services. The accusations against them, uh, as I've said before, are generally that they were agents of uh, fascist governments and so on, uh, spies and, on, and the rest of it, very unspecific. The method used um, was to, uh, the, the method of the amalgam of combining their cases with other cases quite, quite simply by putting their uh, dossiers into, into folders with uh, people who may well have been spies, who had nothing to do with them at all, and then presenting it as a case of them all being together, although there was actually no connection what, whatsoever. You can see at the, in the bottom uh, of the, the image, uh, uh, the an, uh, file of um, Hans Reiter, the commander of the shock battalion, who was arrested for about a month and then uh, released and given a commission in, in the Popular Army. It says, you can see, Gestapo agent terrorist. There was absolutely no evidence for this. Reiter, as I said, was released. But notice that it's number 286 who's filed. The German uh, Communist Party security organization, the KP the Abwa, Abwa drew up lists of hundreds and hundreds of Germans, many of them loyal German communists, in fact, were accused of being spies and traitors and so on and so forth. And this included in those lists um, um, dozens of the Poon volunteers as well. But what the documentation of Soviet archives shows uh, and what the outcome of this, or this the repression shows was that it was totally chaotic. Um, what uh, is, is very clear is that this after arresting some of these people, and we're going to see in a minute a concrete case of that of George Cobb, um, they could not make any of the accusations, did not, there's no evidence of any of these people they arrest and accused being um, even condemned for uh, what they were accused of. Uh, and what you see is a constant complaints between different uh, police uh, units and, uh, and counter. Uh, espionage units that they hadn't got the documents, they hadn't been sent prisoners, people who disappeared, in fact, people left the country. There was a general chaos, and most of them, in fact, would be uh, expelled uh, from Spain rather than anything else. Happened. The other few uh, disappeared, or more to the point, I found no further information, and, then, and, uh, and another part of them would eventually escape at the last minute in January 1937. Now, just to mention one case, um, this of, of George Cobb, because of course, those of you who read um, Homage Catalonia would have read about George Cobb, about Clinton's father, uh, who was mentioned, often termed as, uh, described as always commander. Now, I'm not gonna go into here the complicated story of George Cobb's uh, biography, which is actually a subject of the book by Mark. Uh, Wildermisch, which some of you may know, um, and the 
some of the more mysterious things about his biography. But uh, I'm going to talk about his arrest because a number of things have, I've, I've managed to find out which uh, shed new light on this. Um, now, um, what we know now, we, I mean, he's, he's interrogated. Uh, he wasn't in first thing about it was that he wasn't interrogated until um, the 10th of September, uh, 30, uh, 1937, he was arrested on the 20th of June. But before that, we know that Cop had gone to Valencia with a letter to join the uh, Popular Army. What is not known, although Peter Davison does mention it in his book on all war, is that actually uh, Cop had been appointed to the general staff of the 12th International Brigade, uh, probably as an engineer. Now, uh, this is insignificant again, because it shows, of course, the lack of any sort of consistency in this uh, repression and the fact that they didn't think Cop was a particular threat. He was going to be in the brigades so were dominated by, by the communists. He never took up his position, of course, because after coming up from Valencia, he got arrested. Now, what's clear from the uh, documentation that's available and from his interrogation, that's the reason he's arrested is because of uh, a letter or a document uh, drawn up and signed by a man called Frank Frankfurt, who you can see at the bottom of the image. Frankfurt was a member of the ILP contingent. He was arrested around in some in mid June, sometime a bit before Cop was arrested, of accused of stealing paintings with another volunteer, James Cope. Uh, and to get himself out of this mess, basically, he he decided he would collaborate with his interrogators. And, uh, and the document was drawn up. You can see it. Part of it, the first part of it. Um, there's three pages of it. That's this is the copy of the original, um, which he signs, which describes how the Poon collaborates with uh, the fascist forces, and in particular, uh, how George Cop uh, regularly uh, crossed uh, lines to uh, to to meet with the with the fascists in no man's land. Now, uh, with this information they got from. Frankfurt, which was reproduced in Communist and International Brigade Press at the time, um, Cobb was arrested because of this on the 20th of June. Um, it was reproduced, as I said, in Communist Press, for example, in the daily worker of the United States Communist Party, Robert Miner, who was representative of the US Communist Party in the International Brigades, would say, there was now irre irrefutable proof connecting the Poon to Hitler and Mussolini. General Cobb had taken great quantities of arms and ammunition to no man's land to hand over to the enemy. So even though Frankfurt's document, which he saw, or document which Frankfurt signed, actually doesn't say this, this was enough, you know, that he collaborated. And this was then elaborated and exaggerated, of course, by, <laughs> by the communist press. But Cop was also uh, a victim, as so many others were as well, of great confusion and chaos. I said before, he wasn't he was arrested on the 20th of June. He wasn't actually interrogated to the 10th of September. Um, and this was because they'd lost his papers, but they couldn't, they arrested him and then couldn't find the, the documents which were uh, supposedly had the evidence against him. They also confused him with somebody else, uh, Guido Kopp, who was an anarchist, German anarchist, uh, who was active in Barcelona. For a while, they thought it was the same person. They got very confused though. It's finally worked out who he was. The transcript of his interrogation shows a number of interesting things about uh, Cop, which add to our knowledge about him. One was his, his military knowledge, which um, is quite clear in the interrogation. Uh, and then part of, it, part of it's this, the foot, what you can see on the left of the screen is the first interrogation, which is interestingly enough is in English. This was unusual. Usually these documents are in German or French. Uh, he, he also wrote a, a document about himself, uh, which is in French, where he goes into great details about, in fact, why he was in No Man's Land. He wasn't No Man's Land alone. He's part of it, obviously, for doing recognition and investigation and so on and so forth, which showed uh, a considerable knowledge, uh, military knowledge. The other thing which is quite interesting, given subsequent things we know about Cop, uh, was uh, his, uh, his, his insistence that he, he was a Marxist and that uh, he was a revolutionary. Um, and his comments about Orwell, who he's 
specifically says, of course, who befriended and why he was particularly friends of all. And I will read part of this because I think this is particularly interesting uh, for the George Orwell Society. Um, Cop says of Orwell, he says, I tried to make him a, a, a little less Oxfordian in his attitude. And I soon succeeded in making him understand what was wrong, unjust, and even odious about his ideas. I do not claim to have completed Eric Blair's Marxist education, but I leave, believe I did my best to put him on the right track. It is likely that if he did not subsequently meet a mentor as least as dedicated as myself, he would have fallen back into his old prejudices. It must be said, however, that Eric Blair is a man of remarkable rectitude and perfect intellectual honesty. Now, of course, we, we do know, despite these investigations, despite the mistreatment of the cop, which is documented and his move, they moved him something like 13 or 14 different prisons. In the end, he was released because they could not, they accused him of being, uh, working for, in one of these documents, the conclusion that he works for, he was working for intelligence center of foreign power and then entered the boom, given the offer the best conditions and possibilities one assumes to create havoc or be a spy. He was not condemned and was released, of course. Okay, well, I'm going to finish here. Um, obviously, many things I haven't been able to talk about, but I'm going to finish by uh, a reference to John Cornford. Um, John Cornford, as probably some of you know, was uh, a very young, very uh, uh, well-considered poet. Um, who, who was a student at Cambridge University, a member of the Communist Party. Well, Cornford, um, by chance, ended up in the Poon Militia in the August of uh, 1936. And he was befriended by a group of the German dissident communists, who in Cornford's words, the finest people in some ways I've ever, I've ever met. In a way, they have lost everything. They've been through enough to break most people and remain strong and cheerful and humorous. If anything is revolutionary, it is his comrades. I think the experience of Cornford, because Cornford would uh, go back to Britain in September, early September 36, because he was ill and then would return with some of the first International Brigade volunteers. He died at the age of 21 at the Battle of Opera in uh, 28th of November, 1936. But the poem, he writes on the night of the 2nd of, we write, wrote two poems that are considered two of the best, uh, rep, most representative poems of Civil War poetry on the second of, uh, the night of the 2nd of 3rd of September, one of which is the full moon at tears before the storming of Wesker. The title was, um, gives away the optimism of the militia. They you know, thought they were about to storm Wesker. But um, it is interesting in the sense that, of course, he, although Cornford uh, was a loyal communist, he was deeply impressed initially by his afterwards he would renege on this and criticize it. but at the time he was impressed by uh, his comrades impressed by what he understood was happening the, the last verse of the poem, of the poem um, which ends with the uh, raise the red flag triumphantly for communism and liberty which is taken from the uh, Italian communist anthem bandiera rossa uh, I think it's a uh, very uh, significant in the sense that, of course, for, for Cornford and also for the poem, communism meant human liberation, not what it could come to know as uh, uh, with the experience of Stalinism. And I think the poem uh, by Cornford is a fitting tribute to the anti-fascist combatants with whom he fought, who would be defeated twice over, first by Stalinism, then by fascism, and condemned to forgotten his corner of history, I hope that uh, the book I've written has rescued them from that obscurity, uh, and that was my intention. Thank you very much. Can we please uh, unmute everybody and thank Andy for his excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. That was uh, that was excellent. And uh, who would like to ask the 